Hello and welcome to the Kick in the Creatives podcast, hosted by myself, Sandra Busby, and my fellow creative, Tara Roskell, offering you interviews, inspiration, motivation, and a gentle prod in the right direction. And for lots more information, challenges, and other useful tools to help you get creating, you can go to www.kickinthecreatives.com. And of course, this is where you can also find today's show notes. Enjoy the show. Welcome to today's episode and today we're going to talk about the biggest mistakes beginner artists often make. But before we get onto that, we want to say a big thank you to our latest Kofi supporter, Marcia Furman. We always really appreciate the support and it obviously helps us towards the costs of running Kick in the Creatives, which helps us keep doing what we do and shows that you like what we do. So thank you very much. And we've also want to say thank you for an iTunes review that we've got and it says love. Refreshing, funny and informative. In brackets, now I sound like I'm reviewing a movie or a book. Smiley face. Truly though, it's been so fun listening to your hilarious banter and to get some insight into struggles we face as artists. And that's from Shalika from USA. USA, oh God. Shalika from USA via Apple Podcasts, United States of America. Thank you very much, Shalika. Oh yeah, that was, that's lovely. Thank you so much. And um, we also want to thank everyone who's been sharing their work with us on social media. Um, so Roving J, uh, you know, she's been doing this Kick 365 challenge and um, her theme has been people and I've been so enjoying her drawings. And she's been sharing some of them like at various stages. So like the pencil stage and then she'll ink them and then she'll add colour. And I always like, um, looking at posts like that but I just really like her style really love it if you see those if she'll do urban sketching we've got the urban sketching ca- uh, yeah, challenge I next wonder. month which would really suit her I think it would as well but she's such a good sketcher such a good yeah. sketcher really love her stuff um Melissa Starkweather she's been doing the cartoon in June challenge and she's created some really really characterful faces they are so quirky and I really love her style and it kind of reminds me very slightly I don't know whether she's um, seen Deb Weir's work it's completely different but there's a kind of thread of that feel towards you know to her stuff do you know who I mean yeah well I think I've seen them on Instagram but obviously it's under a different name yeah. on Instagram because <laughs> everything's so confusing like that isn't it yeah. and I'm sure she put that she did a Deb Weir's class so I think she put that they are influenced ah, by Deb, Deb Weir just goes to the show and what's so good about what she does is she hasn't copied Deb Weir so you wouldn't look at it and think oh that's a a Deb Weir's or is it or is it a copy of it? it's not it's obviously just she's found something in her work that she loves and she's used it to make her own work um I suppose better if that's a better if I don't know what the word is but you know to enhance yeah, she's her been own work. inspired yeah. by rather yeah. Than, yeah so I've been really enjoying those um uh Shannon oh this is a hard one to pronounce Shannon Alice plural <laughs> I hope I've pronounced it right she's been doing the um kick crafty challenge and that's a challenge I'll be absolutely useless at because I am rubbish with anything to do with um fabric basically um and what she's been doing she's been making this quilt pattern on denim which she's been painting square by square and it's absolutely gorgeous watching it actually um unfold is is really great so that's been really interesting to watch um Tom Bruds, I've really picked some. <laughs> I've really picked some names here, haven't I? Tom Brudzinski, he's been doing the Quick Kick June challenge, and I love how um, each one has its own little narrative, and I found those really comical as well. And just one more thing as well. I know I mentioned Andy W R last time. Um, remember, I was talking about how good his cartoons yeah, were, and I, I thought he should submit them to a newspaper. Well, <laughs> yesterday, I saw one that he did. Um, that was inspired by Penn Island, which I spoke about a few episodes ago. <laughs> yeah. Did you see it? No. Oh, but I, I, it really, I remember you talking about that. Yeah, yeah. It really made me chuckle that we've done 90 hour long episodes, some even more than an hour, that are meant to be inspiring people to create art. And that was what inspired him. <laughs> And by the way, anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, please don't type Penn Island into your address bar. It's it's really not a good idea. No, it's really not. 
I want to mention some of the Facetastic Fridays, and that's a new challenge we've got on Instagram, where each week on a Friday we put up a new face for you to draw or paint. And this week it was a face of a young guy, and he got a beard and moustache, and he got his hair tied back. And Katie Taylor Bastian did a lovely soft version of him, all with greens and pinks. And I also really liked a monochromatic ink version, and that was by Imaginings by Karen. She does so many drawings. She's so prolific. I love what she does. And there was also a watercolour sketch by Ronnie Sketchit, and that was done with purple and blues. And you know how much I love a bit of purple. You do like your purples. Yes, so I absolutely love that one. So they're great. Keep those coming in. We're loving seeing those. And I say, we have a new one up every Friday, and you just have to get it drawn by Wednesday. But you don't get a naughty mark if you're late. (laughs) Do you know, it's been such a... um... A really, really popular challenge from the offset, hasn't it, that one? And it is only Instagram, yeah. this one. It's just, just for Instagram. But um, everyone seems to be getting involved. It's been, it's been really good. Yeah. yeah, anyway, what is new with you? Um, well, absolutely nothing. And let me tell you why. Because, <laughs> let me tell the listeners why. Um, yeah. Because we are recording this um, a very short time after we recorded our last one where I said what was new with me. And that's because you're going to be taking a couple of weeks off soon. Um, and um, so really not a lot's happened since my last, um, you know, since we last recorded, to be honest. I'm just, um, I'm about to get a load of wine bottles out of um, my a stock of wine bottles I haven't actually got a stock of wine but to try and set some up for uh, my first wine painting but really that's it no, nothing absolutely you nothing sketching it, you, you, you before you used to do a sketch every morning yeah I haven't I haven't had the time to do that for a little while I really need to start doing that again don't I yeah, yeah. I did well I did show you one the other day I'd, I'd sort of scribbled <laughs> yeah did, you I, did I, it's yeah. not like I don't sketch it's just that I I perhaps haven't been doing it every single morning um so so much lately but yeah I do need to start that again actually because yeah. um it, it makes such a difference it really does make such a difference if you do it every day but um yeah what about you have you done anything new in the last two days or however long it's been <laughs> <laughs> well I think I also get a black star because to be honest puppy has taken up a lot of time puppy, <laughs> puppy is quite distra- puppy is quite distracting um but not just that I think but also because I've been doing other things and then whereas I would perhaps be sitting and drawing I've been puppying you know (laughs) playing playing with a puppy but I did actually at the weekend I did get out a sketchbook and started sketching some you know the faces I do where there's little characters inside the face yeah yeah the sort of newer ones, more pop arty, I guess you might yeah, call them. Yeah. So I, I was sketching out some of those in my um, sketchbook. And I've also been doing tons of video editing for our um, new course. But I, I found that I must get a bit bored with video editing. I quite like video editing. But I think when you sit there for quite a while, it just becomes a bit samey, doesn't it? Yeah. And I have actually, because of puppy, because of like this morning I was up at five, I've nodded off at my desk while I'm trying to video edit literally yeah. my head has dropped it's, it's changed everything has it <laughs> you, yeah. you texted me this morning and said do you want to go on now i'm ready i was like oh blimey you're early so i went on because i was ready and yeah. um and the first thing you said was because quite often we'll we'll realize we've been chatting for about 40 minutes before we've even pressed record and we're like oh we better get on and today you're like oh, we need to do this now while the pub is asleep <laughs> <laughs> why is not howling <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah, they are. I mean, they're a handful, aren't they? They really are. Yeah. It's all good fun, though. Um, so, anyway, on that note, I guess we should get onto the episode, assuming there's nothing, obviously, else that you want to say. Um, no, that's it. So, today, we are talking about the biggest mistakes. Actually, do you reckon this is the fastest we've ever got onto the topic? Do you Probably, reckon? yes. Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about the biggest mistakes that beginner artists often make. Um And I think often beginners fall at the very first hurdle because what they do is they attempt to run before they can walk. For example, you might decide that you want to take up art and so you rush out and you buy your paints and you buy some brushes, but you're skipping the most important step of all, which is learning to draw. And, you know, doing it that way is like building a house, but not bothering with the foundations. 
So there are plenty of painters out there who can actually paint beautifully, but the signs are kind of all in the bones of that painting. Usually perspective is the biggest giveaway. But if you skip those fundamentals, you're putting up a hurdle that will keep holding you back. So by taking the time to learn to draw properly, you'll become a good artist much more quickly and you can get great books you know the fundamental of art so that kind of stuff um just to help you along but I, I know I remember when I was beginning I was so desperate to you know get so far so quickly and it's so easy to just skip you know try and think oh yeah I'm, I'm sure that'd be fine I just want to move on to this I just want to get there quickly but actually if you rush it you'll end up taking longer in the long run I remember because I was obviously learning to draw when I was a kid because I was really into it and I was quite young and I used to borrow every book on learning to draw out the library and I have to say I bet now and I haven't looked at them for ages but the kids books on learning to draw used to be really good yeah because obviously <clears throat> kids books simplify everything don't they yeah. it's even good if you're trying to learn anything else so I'd also say check out some of the kids books on learning to draw especially with a complete beginner that's actually a really good idea. I've never thought of that. Hmm. Yeah, I, used to, I think I had ones on like drawing people, drawing horses. And it used to give, <clears throat> I remember the people one had different like how your head went into your body for different ages. Because at different ages of kid, there's different amounts of heads you know, yeah. in a body. Yeah, there you know, is, if yeah. That makes sense. They're, they're big heads, aren't they, children? <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, definitely check those out. Um, I also think another mistake is to watch every tutorial on a topic before actually giving it a try. And this can also be a mistake for more experienced artists, myself included. I don't know about you, Sandra. Um, (laughs) Oh, yes. (laughs) Yeah. Sometimes when you're learning a new media or subject, you watch tutorial after tutorial and you'll enjoy those tutorials. You're trying to take it all in, but you're not actually putting pencil or brush the paper but it feels like you're being productive and it actually almost feels like you know what you're doing I, have you found that a hundred percent I absolutely know what you mean and YouTube channels oh my gosh but just watching someone draw you could almost fool yourself to think that oh well I've learned something from that and and I've kind of been in creative myself in some way but you know you you really haven't (laughs) you might have learned something from it but unless you actually put the practice in afterwards using some of those techniques and trying them out you know it's not doing anything for you is it no I mean I've watched stuff on um, putting down watercolor washes you know wet in wet and I think oh that's yeah I can do that no problem then I actually finally and like beginners finally actually get the brushes out and have a go and like it's a disaster (laughs) it's like you cannot do it just by watching a tutorial and then eventually having one go at doing it it takes so much persistence Uh, and that's where challenges come isn't it because you you will repeatedly work on something like that for a set amount of time yeah and it's only after you've done it for you know, maybe after a couple of weeks of doing one of those a day, we will actually start to, oh, that's why it's not working. Taking watercolour as an example, you see someone doing a wash and it's wet and wet, or you you see someone doing a wash and then they they want to, um, you know, add a a tree, but they want the the wash to be just wet enough that the tree kind of blends, uh, you know, just fluffs out at the edges. And you, it takes practice for you to get the instinct of that when it's dry enough, don't you? And also, you might see someone put a, a wash of blue on, and then they, you know, next to that, they might put some yellow in, and it all blends lovely. But you've got to make sure then you've got more pigment in the next wash, otherwise it's going to, you know, back run into these big cauliflowers, which you might want. But it's those kind of things. It's easy to watch, but you've got to learn why that why what they're doing is working. Because you try it, unless you've got the right water to pigment, you know, going on, it could be a disaster. But you won't know why. But it's that sort of no, thing that you learn as you're going, isn't it? As you practice, and it is a real form of procrastination. I think watching those videos, <clears> isn't yeah. it? Basically, you're just putting off starting. It's almost that scared to start. Yeah. Thing. And I, I still haven't mastered the cauliflower, the watercolour cauliflower, I must admit. Well, most people want to avoid those, but I think they're becoming more people are embracing them. It's, it's one or the other. You either hate them or you enjoy them. 
but yeah, the cauliflower. But it's okay if you, you want them, isn't it? hundred. If you want them, you, what you do. Yeah. In, well, from, from what I can remember, don't forget I'm an oil painter and I haven't used watercolor for a long time. Um, but to get a cauliflower, you you need to leave a slight. You know, when you put a wash down, you've got a slight puddle somewhere. Yeah. You know, in the corner. If you leave that, that will eventually cauliflower out. So it's. You know, or you can do it where you've put slightly less, you, you've used a bit more water. In, Into a, a more uh, saturated wash. Yeah, and then yeah. that can work. But yeah. usually the thing is with cauliflowers, if you try and make them, <laughs> it won't work. But if you just embrace the ones that happen by accident, maybe. sometimes. Yeah, that's I think I've just got to embrace the accidents. Happy accidents, yeah. yeah. But I know exactly what you're saying. It does, it makes you feel almost like you have, and it's like when you read books, art books, you feel like you're actively learning and you are, but that's nothing alone, is it? You know, you feel no, like you've, you've had a productive it. day and you really haven't. Yeah. You haven't at all. Um, using cheap budget materials. Now, I'm not saying that you should go straight for the most expensive materials because that would also be a mistake. But don't go for the cheap materials that you find in those budget shops. You know, a set of 10 paintbrushes from the works for, you know, under a fiver. It's just not, it's just going to hold you back. Go to an art store um, and buy student quality materials, but made by the bigger brands. And this applies particularly to paint, I think. You know, cheap paint just doesn't have that rich pigment that a better quality paint has. You know, the student quality paints are actually really good these days. Um, But perhaps the ones you would get from those budget shops, (coughs) they're definitely not, you know, they're not very good. Um, They're okay for kids. It's great, you know, but I think that's what they're meant for, really, isn't it? And I'll tell you what, another thing, cheap watercolour paper. Oh, my gosh, it is so bad. You can be a really good artist and still get really poor results on really cheap paper. So when you start your art journey, you're investing a lot of time So don't make that time even longer by going straight for the cheap stuff because you're only going to have to go out and buy it all over again. I mean, I know, Tara, you sometimes go to somewhere like the works and you'll buy some cheap things and, and, you know, like rollers and things like that and and paints. But that's when you're playing around experimenting and that's perfect for that, isn't it? But if yeah, you're I've trying to gouache from there before yeah, as well. Yeah, but if you're trying to learn using those things, you're not getting a, a proper idea of how... That things could look if you use something with you know more of a uh, you know they're not all bad but I think the yeah, majority I think of them are I think it very much depends which you pick there. yeah <clears throat> and yeah. A, yeah a lot are you're not going to get great quality it's like I took um, some really cheap paints to an acrylics course yeah I, and the funny thing is I actually have got some decent paints but yeah. they're in absolutely massive pots yeah and I just didn't want to take a, them along to this workshop so I bought a load of cheap ones from the works but they were incredibly thin so yeah. Yeah. in order to get any density you would have to really build up the layers um which is it's fine for experimenting but you're not getting if you're serious about it you and you actually want to do it properly i, I knew i wasn't really going to pursue it then you probably do need to get a bit better quality paint yeah i, I mean imagine if you're trying to learn the drums you've got to learn on a drum kit rather than I don't know, a few dustbins. Do you know what I mean? It's like that, isn't it? You're not getting the full feeling of what it should feel, feel like. Have you ever tried to learn the drums? <clears throat> no, but I'll tell you what. When I used to work um, years ago when in my 20s, I used to work in um, the top floor of um, a department store, the very top floor. And um, there was all this band and they always used to play on a Saturday and they were called the Hot Diggity Dogs and they used to play the dustbins. But the funny thing was, <laughs> they used to wear, they used to wear, they had no, like no top on, but they used to wear these dungarees and really for some, well, it wasn't really dungarees. They were like massive jeans where they were held out with a hoop. And then they had like braces on. That was what they used to wear. It's really funny. But because we were right at the top floor, we used to lean over. We used to be able to see right down their trousers. Oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> Just you. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, oh. you know, what else was I going to do? Did they not have pants on? Oh, they had pants on. Oh, right. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but yeah, that's quite, that's quite funny. Yeah, it sounds like Dexy's Midnight Runners. Are you sure it wasn't? No, it was Hot Diggity Dogs. They were actually really good. <laughs> and then there was one. <clears throat> there was one um, uh, time when oh god, somebody was playing the bagpipes, and I really do apologise to anyone Scottish listening to this. But the bagpipes, I, I really cannot bear the bagpipes. 
it's like a cat being murdered, basically, isn't it? It's awful. And this this um, bagpipe person was playing the bagpipes all day long, oh, no. and you can imagine, can't you? After, I mean, I don't, I can take a you know a few minutes of it, but oh, it was awful, absolutely awful. Could you see down his trousers? <clears throat> I could. S- <laughs> no, 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 his, bag, <laughs> his bagpipe was in the way. <laughs> Uh, you could see his pipes. You could see his pipes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh dear. Anyway, what, where what, were we? Where were we? Where were we? So you were talking about cheap materials, and I yeah. guess this kind of leads onto it. But it's not necessarily about cheapness, but using thin cartridge paper for water-based media. Yeah. And I mean, you might not even do this for the cheapness. You might do it because you know you've got cartridge paper at home, and you fancy having to go at watercolor or uh, ink, you know, with with water maybe. And so you try that, but honestly, it's a complete nightmare. You won't get any idea if you are actually good at this or not, because your cartridge paper will just ripple like nobody's business, and you'll just have pools of pigment, pools of water, and ripples. And it can just make you feel like you're just hopeless, and it's not even worth you, you know, you trying again. And that is nothing to do with you. It's to do with the paper that you've cho- chosen. And I know you said that you shouldn't choose really cheap watercolour paper. And I do agree with that in some ways because I have actually tried the Works watercolour paper. I'm sorry, the Works, but it's shocking. <laughs> it's, it's, it's the worst thing ever. Do not buy watercolour paper from the Works. Not to do watercolour anyway. You know. <laughs> it's awful. It, it's like some sort of... Toilet blotting paper. I don't know. <laughs> it's so like awful. Did, have you used it for toilet paper and stuff? No. Then? Did you use but it in the pandemic done. when everyone could've nobody done. had any toilet roll? <laughs> you yeah. just go to the works for their watercolour paper. Well, <laughs> honestly, but you can get some fairly decent watercolour paper that that is not expensive anyway. Mm. Should I say? It is, but what you want to make sure is you've got a decent weight of paper. So it, it's a reasonable thickness because if you buy the really thin watercolour paper, you almost might as well be using cartridge paper. But if you use something fairly thick, you're actually going to get it so it doesn't ripple so much, you know, if you're not going to bother stretching it. And you're actually going to get a much more of an idea of whether you're going to like using that medium or not. So definitely invest, either invest in some watercolour paper or some decent quality mixed media paper. And yeah, definitely. Li- Those um, watercolour paper pads that are kind of um, glued slightly all the ra- way round each edge, aren't they? They're quite good because you don't have to stretch those and they avoid the rippling. Yeah, even if you get if, if you get a heavy weight even, it's not too bad, is it? You still get a bit of rippling, but I think it's it depends not how bad. heavy your wash is, doesn't it, really? Yeah, yeah definitely. But yeah. yes, definitely go for the um, slightly better paper. And um, the next one is skipping colour theory and that is such a big mistake in fact it's one that I made myself in the beginning because I just found it so boring you know I mean I think I've spoken about this before um you know it was just one of those things it's like it's like everything there's always a side of it that you don't enjoy isn't it Do you know what I mean? but that's oh, the yeah. stuff it's that side of you know a colour theory really but, you know, I, I realised quite early on that I was really struggling to make my colours look natural. And I thought I could skip colour theory because I just thought I'd work it out myself. But it's actually, you know, there's a lot to colour theory. And I think one of the colours I especially struggled with was green. I mean, I would never have imagined back then how much I would rely on the colour red to paint my greens. And I do. But you'd never believe it, would you? You wouldn't think. Why would you want to work, you know, um, add red to green? I mean, obviously, the more experience... Is, it, is that to subtle it down or what, what do you put the red in for? It makes it slightly more natural. It takes that unnatural, acidic um, nature of a, a green straight from a tube right down. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And it depends how much you... And, and also, it depends on the kind of red you're using, you know. But I use a, ver- a variety of reds to add to my greens I mean if you take my bottle painting my recent wine bottle painting which is basically a a painting that is all greens but there's so many um so many greens in that painting but actually I use a lot of red you'd never realize but I use a lot of red in that painting as well but back then I would have thought well why would you use red I don't understand you know what I mean (laughs) yeah so um but uh, 
I was finding it to be a real battle with the colours and I realised quite quickly that I really did need to go back to the beginning of colour theory and learn it if I was going to, you know, make my paintings look more realistic. Um, Oh gosh, it made such a huge difference, it really did. So after after a long time, after years of painting, it's become instinctive now um, of what colour I might need a touch of to get the colour I'm after. So, you know, it's really worth taking that time to learn it. And if you don't bother with colour theory, you're going to find mixing colour really difficult and you'll end up having to buy a load of colours that you really don't need. You'd be amazed how many colours you can get with a, just, just a few varieties of the primaries, you know. And um, and that's another thing, actually, using certain pre-mixed colours straight from the tube. And I guess green is another good example of that. It's just never going to look natural if you don't mix it with even a hint of something else. And um, another one I don't like as well, black, straight from the tube. That's another one. And I've, I heard that before years ago. I thought, oh, well, I don't understand. Black is black. But it's, it's very true. Black from a tube is so flat. So try mixing your own black, maybe with a, um, an ultramarine blue and some burnt sienna. And then you can just add a tiny touch of a third pigment. I don't know, maybe a little and crimson or something like that. And then that changes the quality of your black again. And you can get such a variety of rich blacks by mixing them yourself. And it makes your paintings a lot more interesting and unique. It's funny, actually, even in graphic design... If you're creating, if you want a flat black, so if you imagine you've got a brochure and you want a page of black, you'd think, well, I'm just going to fill that with black, wouldn't you? L literally. Yeah. And mm. then the printer would print a black ink. But you don't. You fill it with a bit of another colour. Yeah. So you might fill it with 100% black and some cyan because, it, like you're saying, it gives it richness. It, it does. It, and, and, and you just want it, it almost gives it a shine, even on a bit of printed material, which is quite weird. Yeah, it's but so you, you true. I can't, I can't understand why in every set of, if you buy a pre-made set of paints, and pretty much for anything, you always get blinking greens, oh, ready-made greens. And, yeah. you, I mean, black, to be honest, I use black because I use black in a different way to you. Yeah. You know, I use black outlines, so mm. I'll use black pencil. And, and I think it's fine if you're using it for a purpose or do, if you're doing realism totally agree with you yeah but in but sort of maybe what type of thing i'm doing i think you can get away with using a ready made black i think because you it's can, more of an outline yeah and 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 also you can use your ready made black but uh, you know add to it to make yes. it richer so i will use it um like i'll use it and then put a purple over the top my favorite purple over mm. the top to make a dark purple say for yeah. example things like that but i don't get it why do they put these in in every single set a beginner's set i know it's strange isn't it and they usually so, give you the most awful lime green there's totally nothing in life is that color <laughs> yeah but again you can some... you can use them but you just need to then use them as a base and then add to them to make something a bit a bit different you know yeah usually the same maybe... with white isn't it in watercolors mm, yeah watercolor sets little pans always have a white it's a, it must be a gouache mustn't it i don't know but it's it's just strange anyway moving on um another one is another mistake is using a pencil and a rubber instead of a pen now but there is absolutely no harm in using a pencil but the good thing about using a pen or a fine liner is that it forces you to commit to your line rather than be too hesitant. Like when you're using a pencil, when you first start, you might draw a line, think, "Ah, oh, that's not right. I'm going to rub it out," and you could end up doing that ten times. Whereas if you use a pen, you've committed to it, and if you go wrong, just add another line near it to where it should be. And sometimes those lines actually give your drawing character, and it also teaches you. Not to be more careful, but I guess to think more about where you're placing the line. I don't know if you agree with that. And, and see where you went wrong. <clears throat> but I always yeah. think you can, use a, you can use a pen very lightly. I mean, I've seen this where, and I do this as well, I use a pen very, very lightly. And then when I find the line that you know, is the best, I'll, I'll just you know, darken it up a bit. Yeah, I do that too, especially if I'm doing intuitive characters, because I don't know what I'm drawing, so there's all these really light lines and then you're going in with a much darker one afterwards mm, yeah 
Uh, another mistake is holding your pen as though you're writing. Now, when you're writing, you tend to hold your pen really low down and really rigidly. Whereas when you're drawing, you actually probably want to change the position of your hand. So if you're drawing something quite loosely and you want to get flowing lines, you might put your hand, your fingers higher up on the on a on the pen or the pencil, whatever you're using. And then when you get to more detail, you'll probably move it down. But you don't want to be as rigid as when you're you're writing. Actually, I think as well using <clears throat> your your fingers only, if you know what I mean, to move the pen. Whereas you oh, should yes, be yeah. using your whole arm. I mean, I know now when I sketch in my sketch pad, my my whole hand is sort of moving around the page. It's not just my wrist; it's my yes. it's my arm, and that yeah. makes a massive difference to your sketching when you do that. When you just, it just makes you a lot more fluid. I think one of the really difficult things actually when you're trying to video your drawing. Yeah. I don't know if you find this, but like. If I'm if I'm sketching in a sketchbook, I've got a bit of paper. I'll be turning my bit of paper around, yeah, and then I'll be trying to get my. If I've got a curve, I want kind of, I want my elbow to be where the middle of the curve is. Almost, yeah, like. you yeah, like use it like a compass. <laughs> yeah, you always use it like a compass. Yeah. Whereas when you're trying to video yourself, yeah, you have to be much more like you're writing. Yeah, so. If you see us on video, but looking much more rigid it's because we're trying to keep the paper still. <laughs> I remember doing that great big marble painting, and I was just having to constantly turn my canvas around because I was on the same as you. I was using my elbow to uh, like as that center point, and then yeah, my arm would be my hand would be flowing around it to form these circles, you know. And it, my I was constantly having to turn it upside down and sideways, and it was a blooming great canvas as well. It was like I don't know four foot by. Four, three foot three and a half foot by four and a half foot, I can't remember but a big canvas have to keep lugging it and off the easel and back on and it was a nightmare <laughs> you know there must be really somebody <clears throat> should come up with a really clever easel where you could actually sort of oh, fix it from the back and then sh- turn it oh just, no idea you've just given it you now you've given away a product idea oh <gasps> I'd buy that yeah you should invent that yeah any easel makers were willing to team up yes it, we thought of it, yes. well, no, I didn't think of it at all. Tara thought of it first. Yes. Um, anyway, not drawing enough. That's another one, obviously. Who, who hasn't been drawing enough lately? Uh, me. <laughs> <laughs> so, but when you're learning in particular, it's so much better to draw a little bit very often than it is to draw for a few hours, maybe once or twice a week. You know, even if it's just five, 10, 15 minutes a day, drawing regularly is key. And it's important as well to put quantity over quality to start with. So for example, if you're going to spend a few hours drawing or trying to draw one figure perfectly, you would learn a lot less than you would if you spent 30 minutes sketching the figure you know, several times, multiple times. So sketch regularly, sketch every day if you can. Even if, even if it's just a few minutes, you're much better doing that way. You're going to get um, better a lot quicker. Uh, another mistake is worrying too much about the outcome instead of enjoying the process. And, and this, I think, again, it's not just beginners. It's all of us. I think we all do this. Um, but especially in those first few months when you're trying to draw, you're really unlikely to get the results you want. So you may as well just enjoy the process of learning and creating because it ain't going to be great. Let's face it, <coughs> no. probably isn't going to be great. But after a few months, if you keep you keep those original drawings and then compare it with your newer ones, um, you should start to see the difference. Like it, it's it's so strange, isn't it? And we said that loads of times before. Like for some reason, because when we were kids, we drew we drew, we expect then to be good at it, but you wouldn't expect a musician to pick up an instrument and immediately be great at playing you'd you'd know that it's going to take years to become good at playing something but we don't feel the same about art have lessons yeah Yeah. but and you would expect it to take years i think yeah you were learning whereas i think even with art you expect it to be weeks or you know you expect a much smaller time i'm not saying you can't get better quickly but in general, it's going to take a long time. And I remember when I started drawing by hand again, oh my God, they were terrible because I used to draw loads. So even though I'd drawn loads when I was younger, starting to draw by hand again really took a lot of practice to sort of 
get better again. And every now and again, Facebook shows me one of them. And it's like, oh, no, <laughs> I don't want to see that. Yeah. I don't want to see it. And I've got somewhere, I can't remember for actually, I know you're not supposed to throw sketchbooks away, but I do. I've got one that I did. I think it was one of our first ever challenges about, oh, God, was it three years ago? I don't know. Um, but anyway, it was an art journal challenge. And I look through there and it makes me cringe to look at the drawings. It's <laughs> so bad. But I think we, well, we do go backwards if we, if we, you, like you said, you, it's a, it's a bit like you go to the gym and you get really good at whatever, you know, you're doing and you start, you get all these muscles, don't you? And yeah. you look really good. Your body's fit and all the rest of it. It's the same with drawing that if you then stop exercising for, um, I don't know, three months, say, or six months, and then you go back to it, although the muscle memory is there, so you'll get there quicker than you would have done, but at the end of the day, you still slip backwards. Your body's not going to be that fit anymore, and you've got to start again, you know? God, that same reminds me when I got up this morning. What? Five o'clock, I could barely move. I got out of bed like a robot. If anyone had seen me, cause I was puppy at five o'clock, um, came downstairs, walking like a robot, because I was so stiff, my whole body, came downstairs, went outside, couldn't see because my contact lenses were drying up, <laughs> standing in the garden, like, walking around like stiffly, blinking like I'm about a hundred. <laughs> anyway. Do you know, it's funny, it's funny you should say that. I always know in the morning when Paul is putting his socks on. He always gets really? changed. It's very good. He takes his clothes um, and lays them out on the bathroom floor for the morning so he doesn't wake me up. But I'm always awake when he gets up. And I always know when he's putting his socks on because I can hear him going, oh, 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 like this. It takes him you, ages. You think he's putting his socks on, maybe. He's... <laughs> oh, dear. Anyway. Anyway. Not drawing from life. So really easy in this digital world that we live in to reach for our computers to find reference and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that at all it's actually really really handy but you also need to practice drawing from life as often as you can too because it's almost a different skill and it's so much fun when you can do it I, I love sketching from life but the problem with photos is that they kind of they lack that depth that you need and often I think the perspective can be quite obscured so if you happen to miss that then that is going to scream at you in a, in a drawing or a painting so try practicing um, from life as often as you can. Yeah, that's been quite tricky. Not tricky lately. It's been tricky if you like drawing people, hasn't it, lately? Yeah, and urban sketches, I suppose, because obviously two years not really being able to go anywhere. No. <laughs> I think I think digitally has been great for this last couple of years. But, um, you know, now we are, well, I, you know, it's not like this everywhere, obviously. But f from, from our point of view, it, things are getting a lot better so it's easier to get back out there and go to a coffee shop and it's the tr the problem is with when you've had what have we had about 18 months really where we've not nothing's been normal everything's been shut down and coffee shops have been shut down <clears throat> and the problem with that is that you can then get into a habit can't you of you know, not going out, not seeing lots of people, you know. I spoke to someone the other day, actually, and they said, oh, I, I just, I don't feel comfortable anymore in, in a room full of people, which is is literally because for the last 18 months they haven't. Yeah, and it's God. like anything, isn't it? You go, you, if you're not used to going out and about anymore because you've kind of got out of that habit, um, you know, it's it's something you kind of need to just get back on the horse. If you if you are in a position now where your coffee shops are open or um, the seafront is, you know, there's people walking up and down the seafront, it's a sunny day, get out there and start sketching again because you don't want to drop that habit. You want to get that habit back. Yeah, I mean, I always really admire people who, and it's terrible because I don't do it, who at home can find loads of things to draw. So it's Kosha Kuna, for example. She, <coughs> she's yeah. draw, she'll draw like coffee cup on the table or a bookshelf or a working you know working area but for me I just do not like drawing those things I think I mean, it's, it's because what it's we have our own surroundings to us are quite boring aren't they because we see them all the time perhaps we miss the beauty of what's around us because we just it's just something that's so ordinary to us 
Yeah, I think so. Because I mean, I must admit, when I've been on holiday before, it's it's much more interesting to draw things when you're in a holiday cottage where yeah. it's all new stuff that you haven't seen. Mm. Yeah. And I guess as well, because we haven't got that many knick-knacky type things, so there's not so much maybe to draw. I don't know. Yeah. Another thing is when you're a beginner is seeing your mistakes as failure. But really, you're going to make mistakes. And as long as you learn something from what you're doing, they're not a failure at all. They're actually a step forward towards where you, where you want to be. Um, and I think sometimes even those mistakes can make your work a lot more interesting. Even when you're more experienced, sometimes you can do something that you don't intend to do and it actually really adds something to your drawing. Makes it quirky. Yeah. I think um, you're right, though. Seeing mistakes as a failure is it's something I think beginners always do. But the thing is, I actually think the mistakes are the most important thing because if you don't make mistakes you cannot learn you know you don't learn if you don't do something wrong so they're far from a failure they're what those mistakes are what are propelling you forward so every time you make a mistake you've got to think great I learned something not oh you know I've done it wrong it doesn't matter you've done it wrong because you've done it wrong you're more likely to then do it right next time you've learned something so yeah, don't ever see them as a as a failure. They're just stepping stones. That's all they are. I think as well. I mean, we had a challenge that was to do a blind contour drawing. And that is when, if you don't know, it's when you you look at your subject, whatever you're drawing, but you don't look at your paper, so you don't look at your hand either. And a lot of people in our group seem to be really love what they'd created. Yeah. And I think part of that is because you're not worried about the mistakes you make because you can't see the mistakes you're making. They're just coming up. But again, it gives, like you said, it gives that quirk to your drawing. And it, what I quite like about it, if you do something like that, is you then draw back into it. So you start off with a blind contour and then you'll go into it while you're looking and you'll get something really interesting. Yeah, I like the blind I like doing the blind contours, say, say if I'm looking at a face yeah, and I look at that face and I won't look at the paper... But then every now and then, just look down once to just see where you're at, if you know what I mean. So you stop, yeah. you know. And actually, it's got all the qualities of a blind contour, but also is more likely to look what, <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah. like, like a person. <laughs> yeah. I, and, I, you know, I've done them like that before as well, where you just look a little bit once, once every time you perhaps lift your pen to do something. I like the um, continuous line drawings are great as well. And obviously you can't do, you can't, you don't have to not look to do those, but that's quite tricky to do a continuous line. And I think it's all those challenges we've done, like um, draw with your left hand, do, draw a continuous line, draw a blind contour. The reason people are very happy to share those and, and, and laugh about those is because, that they were always going to be um, uh, drawings <laughs> that were weird and not right, if you like, you know what I mean? So it's like it, it, you've given yourself permission to do a bad drawing. But actually, you know, by doing that, sometimes you come up with the, the most fun drawings you've probably ever done. But they're yeah, not mistakes, they're deliberate mistakes. And I think that's that's an important part of learning to draw as well sometimes do make just have fun and make deliberate mistakes you know you know I think it's going back to the idea of the um enjoying the process Mm. and I think those type of drawings you definitely do enjoy the process yeah definitely yeah more fun they are more fun um I don't know where we are oh yes comparing yourself yes how did you know that I don't know (laughs) so comparing yourself to more experienced artists. So when we start out, we instantly start looking at other artists' work and we want to be as good as them. But along the way, you'll come across more and more work that is just so good that it just becomes <laughs> just intimidating, doesn't it? I mean, you know, but you have to kind of remember. It's like when, you, when you're when you on Instagram, isn't it? You, you know, you're, you're going, oh, I like this. And you'll look, look up, I don't know, perhaps you might look up are abstract faces hashtag abstract faces and you'll yeah you'll be looking through loads of them and suddenly you'll think oh my gosh I really like what they're doing and oh my gosh I really like what they're doing and then suddenly you'll look at your own work and think oh my god I'm not I'm not so confident about my own stuff now so it's it's important to remember that everyone is just different you know and some people are just way more experienced and what you have to remember as a beginner is that those artists 
didn't come out of the womb holding a paintbrush. You know, they were also once a beginner, just like you. So it's important um, not to compare yourself to someone far more experienced than you are because it's pointless. You know, all that'll do is make you feel like you're not good enough. So look at artists who are just um, one or two steps ahead of you. And then once you feel like your work is at the same level as theirs, then look at artists who are just a bit more experienced and, you know, one or two steps further and then make that your goal. And by, you know, doing that, you're taking baby steps and that'll be working for you much better than it will if you try to leap for something that seems so far away. And also, you know, like I was saying to you, Tara, about faces and things, you're actually when you're comparing your work to someone else's you're you're comparing styles as well people develop styles over time and you know it, you can't compare one style to another because they're always going to be completely different yeah it's really hard to compare if you say for example if you go for the type of work you do yeah and you've got this realistic still life and then you're trying to compare that to a really abstract face yeah. I mean, really much more abstract than mine. It's like, well, who says one is better than the other? They're not. No. They're just completely worlds different. apart. And yeah, and completely different things. But you could be the best in your field in that, and they could be the best in their field in, in that. If you can even be the best, because it's all opinion again, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, me being a kind of realism painter, I know that sometimes I've looked at other people who have painted, I don't know, wine bottles or whatever, and they've done it in the most abstract way and or really kind of impressionistic. And I thought, wow, I love that. I love that. Oh, but that is their style. And, I, you know, I have a different style and it might be that they're looking at my work, probably not, but... <laughs> Say, you know, <laughs> oh, don't um, put yourself down. Yeah. No, but do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah, other yeah, people might be looking at my stuff going, Oh, I wish I could paint like that. It, it's, it's important to just um, own what you do and just make yours as best as you can, you know. Uh, I think yeah. I think that's when you actually realise you are getting somewhere mm. is when you get a message saying, I love your art, and you think, Oh, wow, yeah. I know, yeah, yeah. Amazing. So another mistake beginners often make is worrying too much what other people think. Now, if you do decide to share your early drawings, you might be worried that people will take the mickey out of you, maybe. But if you share it on a nice, friendly platform like Instagram or even in a group like our Kicking the Crazy Facebook groups, most people are actually really supportive. You're going to get the very, very rare occasion when someone will be mean. And also remember that every artist at some point will have worried about what they were posting, whether that's because it's something new that they haven't tried before or whether it's, you know, they're trying a new subject. The key is just to put it out there anyway or to hold it back and don't share it yet, you know. There's a quote that goes like this, and I don't know who said this quote and I couldn't see who to attribute it to, but it's basically, when you're 20, you care what everyone thinks. When you're 40, you stop caring what everyone thinks. When you're 60, you realise that no one was ever thinking about you in the first place. (laughs) I think it's not really just about age, is it? The the last bit is the key. Really, everyone is so concerned about what they're doing, how they're looking, that they really don't care about you at all. That's so true. It is so true. Yeah. I know. So... As I say, don't make the mistake. If you don't feel like you're ready to share, don't share. You can keep a secret sketchbook. And then you can just share selective drawings if you're pleased with them. But I say, just don't worry too much. Just put it out there if you want to. Honestly, people will have forgotten about it in a day anyway. I once um, attempted to um, keep a secret, a secret sketchbook. And I slotted it underneath the sofa. We've got a sofa that I suppose it sits about um, maybe a couple of inches off the floor. Yeah. And um, actually, it's our old sofa. The one now is a bit higher. But yeah, so I, I'd, I'd slot it under there so that when Paul wasn't about, if he was late home from work for whatever reason or, you know, he was doing whatever, I'd be like, oh, I'll quickly pick, have a little scribble. And I slotted this sketchbook under the um, sofa and it was there for about, I don't know, 10 minutes 
It's the first time I'd hit. I had. I decided to have a secret sketchbook. It was there for ten yeah. minutes, and Paul walked in. And he goes, "What's that under the sofa?" Oh no! <laughs> and he found it straight away. Were so you? If you're were you worried sec- about hiding it from Paul? Were you? No. Well, no, no. It was just the fact that you know people talk about this, and it is important <laughs> yeah. to have a secret sketchbook. And if it's going to be a secret sketchbook, then yeah, it's have a secret well, hide a hole, has it? Yeah, have, get a hiding place that's going to work. Now yeah. let's think about this. We need to, yeah. Where would you hide a secret sketch? So have you got one now? No, I don't care what Paul sees. No. What I don't like, uh, and this this is still me now, is I, I don't bother about a secret sketch, but that, it doesn't bother me. You know, around the house, Kevin can see whatever. He can look at all, all my sketches. Um, but what I don't like is if you take a sketchbook, say, round someone's house so i've done it before when we've gone around his nephew's house yeah you know and having a dinner around there and i want to draw people so i want to practice drawing all of them and i don't like it then if people want to look at it but the things they're almost because i've bound to aren't they actually they were actually quite good really? they didn't really bother me that much but it worried me that they would ask because you you've got two problems going on there one you might not like what you've drawn or, you know, you might not be, you're practicing because so, I mean, I wasn't that confident about drawing people from life. So that, that's one. But then you've got two, <laughs> that you then offend someone by how you draw them. That's so the thing, a, isn't it? Yeah. And if you're you've going got a double to their whammy. house and you've got a, you're starting to draw someone. Yeah. I, I just can't imagine not going, oh, what can I see? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you, you're bound to, aren't you? It's like, it's like when you drew me in London when I'm sort of looking down and you get me like a double chin. Because <laughs> of how I'm, it's like, oh, I don't like that bit. Don't put that in. I've got one where I actually covered your whole head up with a post-it and started again. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> yeah. I don't remember that. Yeah. Oh, it was If awful. only you could do that in real life, eh? Just yeah. put a post-it on your face and <laughs> draw, in a, draw in a nicer one. Ah, uh, uh, what else? Oh, yes, getting too attached to, to a drawing. And uh, you wrote this one, I think, Tara. And there is no better feeling, is there, than the first time you draw something and it turns out really, really well or even better than you'd hoped. So, you know, something you're actually proud of and that you don't mind other people seeing. Well, I can guarantee that a year or two down the line, with a lot more practice behind you, you're going to look back at that drawing and you are going to cringe. (laughs) You might think it's amazing now, but I promise you in a couple of years, you won't. And the simple reason for that is that you're going to be drawing way, way better in a couple of years. So in the early stages, you've just got to look at every drawing as a a stepping stone, a means to getting better. And don't be precious about anything. Dare to experiment with it. It might ruin it, but you've learned something from it. I mean, you were talking about that earlier, weren't you, when you looked back at some of your stuff and cringe. But at the time, I'm sure you thought it was great. Some of it I thought was great. Some of it I thought probably thought was pants anyway. But yeah, <laughs> it's probably a bit of a mix. <laughs> yeah. But th- there's also a mistake that beginners, beginners can make, which is moving on too quickly before mastering a technique or a subject. But there's also the converse of that, which is sticking rigidly to something, even though it may not be right for you. And I think there's a really, really tricky balance to get here. Because when, when you're a beginner, it can be really frustrating when you're trying to master a new skill. So you need to actually give it long enough to actually see if you do like it. And it's not just those frustrations of not being able to do something yet. And I think if we go back to the watercolor, that's the classic, isn't it? So if you decide, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to learn how to paint watercolors, and you, you do it for like two or three days, well... Is it actually that you don't like watercolours or is it actually that you're really bad at it because you don't know what you're doing yet? So you need to give it time. So you need to give it maybe 30 days, test it. And then at the end of the 30 days, you think, okay, I kind of get the grasp of how I'm supposed to do watercolours. Do I like it? Yes, I do. Carry on. Or don't I like it? In which case, then try something new. But it, it really is tricky to work that out, I think. Yeah, definitely. Oh, it's me again. Um, (laughs) You might also be afraid to try something new. And that, I think, happens once you start to get a good grasp of a subject or medium. You're then afraid to move out of that comfort zone. And I can remember when I was a teen, 
I love drawing in black and white. So I would be constantly drawing in, mainly in pencil, but also in ink. And I got, so I was, you know, quite decent at it. But I was really scared of colour, which seems crazy now. It does. So basically, you can't I believe it by looking at your work now. I know. I'm ever hardly, scared of colour. I know. I hardly ever use colour just because I'd kind of sort of mastered, not mastered, but I was, you know, pretty decent with a pencil. And so it's like, I don't want to use colour because if I start using colour now, it's going to look rubbish compared to my black and white drawings. Of course it's going to look rubbish. I didn't do it. Mm. But had I never got over that, I now would still be painting and I'd still be drawing in black and white. I wouldn't be using colour at all, which would be... I would hate, to be honest, because I don't even like drawing in pencil much now. No, it's funny. I always used to draw in pencil all the time and now I... I don't like, I've got a sketchbook full of pencil drawings and I look at it and think, oh, it just seems so grey and bland. And, you know, even just moving on to a pen, I've got, then I've moved on to just using pens and washes and so much more interesting. So just so much more, um, I don't know, just dynamic, maybe. Yes. I mean, they were still black and white, but it was, yeah, you know, and then, you know, then again, it's colour, isn't it? It's like, oh, I'm a bit worried about using colour. You just have to... If you look at any artist, any famous artist that, you know, even dead artists, you look back at their work from start to finish, it, they all have one thing in common, and that is that they all evolve over time. Their work changes slightly over time. And the only reason that's happened is because they've tried new things. They don't even just change slightly. They can change quite radically. And yeah. if you look at the work of like Picasso, yeah, from his quite realistic sketches to really abstracted stuff, it's yeah, because completely I was think, different. Yeah, I used to think, could he actually draw? But yeah, I looked back at some of his really early work and he really could draw really yeah. well. But he just, you know, developed this style, this experimental style, became his what he's famous for, you know? And I think it might have also been because I guess... Once you master that being able to draw incredibly well, you either totally fall in love with that and you just, that is what you want to do, or you think, okay, what now? And so you have to break it down in some way. But going back to what I said in the very first thing, which was um, learning the fundamentals before you learn to paint, it just goes to show that the most successful abstract artists or, you know, such as, say, Picasso, the reason they're successful is because they do, they learnt the fundamentals first and then they broke the rules. They didn't just start by thinking, oh, well, I I don't need to, I'm just going to go straight into abstract. Even abstract painters um, need to know the basics. Yeah, the only thing I I have problems with, like, learning the fundamentals, don't get me wrong, I I think it's a great idea to, you know, learn how to draw before you you go further yeah but I think you've got to be careful because what you don't want to do and and someone actually sent me a message about this they felt like they should they felt like they should and it's a big should Mm. be learning the fundamentals of drawing um but it bored them silly and the problem is if you if you do stick with that too much you're going to end up hating it yeah so it's probably best if you feel like that Maybe to sprinkle in a little odd fundamental with the things that you like doing more. Because otherwise you're just not going to do it. Well, yeah, let's remember as well that there are beginner artists or beginners out there who are actually just, they want to learn to be creative and paint or draw or whatever. But, you know, and it's literally because they want to do something they enjoy as a hobby. So then it's, it doesn't matter so much about those boring fundamentals that's not really a problem if as long as you're being creative and having fun that actually doesn't matter but if you are wanting to become someone who perhaps sells their work or whatever um and take you know taking things more seriously in that way then obviously you can't really skip the fundamentals you do need to know but yeah it yeah. just depends and- doesn't it and the type of style I think you're going to paint in as well. I mean, yeah. I think it's useful for everything, but yeah. say for was, realism, like you definitely need to know it. It's the difference between writing a diary and writing a novel. If you write a diary, you're having fun, you're enjoying your writing, but it doesn't matter if you've done a few spelling mistakes or your grammar's not quite right, or you've missed out the odd, you know, comma or whatever. It doesn't matter. But if you're writing a novel, you have to know all of that stuff is really important. 
Do you see what I'm saying? That's just the yeah, difference but, between the two. Uh, again, I'm going to... You're I'm gonna argumentative get, Yes, me I am going to argument. What are you arguing about now? <laughs> I'm arguing because I've been getting up early in the morning. Oh, so, no. Oh, no. Yeah. Oh, dear. <laughs> I, I'm arguing that I don't think you necessarily have to do all that to be a well-known and famous artist because we no. all know that there are some <laughs> dreadful pieces <laughs> of very famous art. Yeah, You're so who, right. And I'm guessing it's come from marketing or, I don't know, some someone influential has liked something they've created. So yeah. I don't think we can totally say this. I just think that if, if you're going to paint realistic, or then yes, it's probably better to have such, those spent. Yeah. Such a good point you've just made, yeah. yeah. So I don't think um, it's necessarily about success. Should, no. should we move on before we argue? <laughs> no, because I'm agreeing with you. I'm totally oh, agreeing okay. with you. Well, I don't agree with me. Um, so worrying too soon about finding a style, that's another mistake um, that beginner artists can make. This seems to be a huge thing, the biggest thing that artists obsess about, isn't it? Finding a style. But I honestly think that if you don't overthink it, style will eventually develop over time, even if you don't really try to find it. If you just let it happen naturally without worrying about it, it will just creep up on you eventually. It might take years, but it will happen. And and you might not even realise that you've already got one, um, or at least the beginnings of one. And I think the worst thing you can do um, is to copy someone else's. You can't just pluck a style off the shelf. It's fine to find inspiration from other artists because you're seeing something, you know, they do that really speaks to you. But your style should say a lot about your own personality. It should say something about you. And that can only come from the inside. So be careful not to be over influenced by other artists. Yeah, I think though you can actually speed up the process. Yes. but, But again, I think that's just from drawing more I think once also you find a subject that you like drawing so like for me it's faces now Mm. I might not have found my forever style but I've pushed myself in the right direction I think and I think if you look at all the influences you do like and then you say okay and I like painting this subject then at least you're going to concentrate on that one thing and I think your style will come more quickly that way but you shouldn't worry about it too much definitely uh, and also, you might be scared that you aren't doing things correctly. And correctly is in those funny inverted commas. I'm now holding my hands up and doing that funny sign <laughs> Like thing. we can but, see you. <laughs> but, I mean, you're actually assuming there that there is only a one correct way of doing things. And I don't think you should just rigidly stick with that. You should learn what is supposed to be the correct way, but then you do what feels right to you, I think, if it doesn't work. For example... I looked, when I was trying to learn some watercolour basics, I looked at, you know, different watercolour. I just found it so boring because they were all laying down these flat washes, what, waiting for them to dry, which is how I used to paint when I was a lot younger. So you'd wait for this watercolour wash to dry and then you'd put another one on top, wait for that to dry. And I just found it really tedious. I used to and use then a hairdryer. I, yeah, I know, but just the fact that you're waiting Mm. for these flat washes it was just boring and then I saw the work of Jean Haynes Mm. um, and she works very loosely with watercolor but had I not seen her or had you not seen some artists like that you might assume the correct way to work was in these layers with maybe just a little bit of wet and wet whereas she works completely differently uh, a very different style to most people and also if you read the books by Felix Scheinberger he actually he does very different watercolors and drawings, and he actually says in those books um, that a member of his family said he didn't draw properly, and yet loads of people now love how he draws. So I don't think there's always a correct way to do things. I think it's the um, the variety of different ways that people do things that make art the interesting thing that it is, and that's why we love looking at people like. Louis Rosignol and Felix Scheinberger and Kosha Kuhn, all those different people that do it, everything in such a different way, but their own way. And it, I think it makes it so... I mean, if, if we were all aiming to be in the same place, how boring would that be? 
Yeah, I mean, I was really surprised when we were talking to Carrie Waller. It was on the podcast, I can't remember which episode, a uh, fairly recent one. But she was talking how she paints watercolours. And it's so different to how I would say for a traditional watercolourist. Again, it's not the, oh, paint these big washes on, on the whole of the of the um, paper, is it? She works in little squares, yeah, I mean, she's doing what works for her to make her paintings um, the paintings they are. And that's the thing, isn't it? It's finding your own way. Yeah, um, exactly. And her paintings are amazing. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I was surprised when I was surprised when she said that as well. I was like, really? Yeah. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Um, another mistake, not doing enough active learning. So practice alone is not enough. So for example, you can sit down and you can draw a person a hundred times as a beginner. But if you're not also looking at books on figure drawing or online art tutorials or going to life drawing classes, then your progress is going to be really slow. So by actively learning um, and reading books and looking at tutorials and things like that, you can use the things you learn the next time you put pencil to paper and your progress is going to be a lot, lot quicker. Um, so yeah, that's, that's really important. But equally though, you can um, have the complete opposite problem where you read all the right books and you watch all the right tutorials, but you don't actually get around to uh, actually drawing, um, <laughs> which is, I suppose, we touched on that earlier. So you have yeah. to do both. You've got to do both. Another mistake is being afraid to ask for advice. And, and just don't be afraid because, you know, don't feel stupid about it or that you're bugging someone because most people nowadays are really approachable and it's so easy to reach out to someone. If you just go onto Instagram, you see an artist you like, as long as they're not absolutely huge, then if you drop them a message, most people will be quite happy just to give you a few tips or, you know, put put you right on how to do something and if they don't answer you it's not personal it's not because they think you're stupid it's just because they haven't seen your message or because they get so many that they can't deal with them yeah so tara's basically saying um if you have any questions about i'll just give her um drop her an email <laughs> and she'll answer anything you you need to know and i probably won't have a clue <laughs> finally the um the the biggest biggest biggestest mistake i think beginners often make is giving up too soon so honestly if you really want to be a good artist and you put enough effort into it you really will be but it will take time and it will take patience and the worst thing you can do is give up six months or a year down the line because you're still not happy with your art if you stick at it they would they will absolutely be a day when you get that aha moment and you just start, I don't know, you just start getting it. And once that happens, then the learning process becomes a lot quicker. But it's not going to happen overnight. And the thing is, you know, wherever you are in your art um, you know, process, you're always going to want to be better. However good you get, you're going to always be moving the goalpost. So, um, yeah, don't ever give up because it will come eventually. You just have to have patience. I remember we had an urban sketcher on the podcast. Uh, her name was Lynn Chapman. And she talked about a beginner that used to come along to the urban sketchers group that she went to. And she said when she started, obviously she wasn't very good because she'd never done it before, but she really, really wanted it. So she'd go to loads of the urban sketchers meetups. She'd learn things from all the people who were there and did loads of practicing. She said after a year, she could pretty much draw anything she wanted. That is amazing. It just goes to show, doesn't it? A lot of it's about determination and, and how much time and effort you put into it. Yeah. If only we could go urban sketching every day, eh? I know. And, and the thing is, obviously, what she did as well is she she um, accepted the fact that she wasn't good in the beginning and just carried on. And know? she asked for advice because she got yes. advice of all those other urban sketches yeah. that were there. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And concentrated practice. Yep. Perfect. So there you go. <laughs> anyway... <laughs> Shall we read out the answers to our previous question? And the previous question was, what's your own personal most extreme example of procrastination? We had loads of answers to this. We have. Um, uh, this, I'm guilty of this. This is Kathy Richardson and she says, putting chores or anything else that needs my time in front of my art time. I've got Margaret Gray and she says, basically what I'm doing now, scrolling on Facebook. I'm guilty of that one. 
Yeah, I think most people are, aren't they? Rachel Redding, doing barely any art as an adult. I'm 50 next month, she put in brackets. Well, Rachel, let me... Yeah, but yeah, but doing any barely any art as an adult, I presume she meant until you know up to now. Let me say this to you, Rachel: you are younger today than you are ever going to be again. So grab that moment, pick up that pencil, and then when you're sixty, you're going to have ten years of practice behind you. So don't wait, do it now. I know you are doing it now, but (laughs) anyone else out there who thinks it's too late, you know, consider that you're kicking the creatives from me. I've got Joanna Brown and she says, I take on new projects all the time rather than putting the effort into getting things finished. Okay, I've got Jackie Husi-Pulutsky. I can never print it because art by Jackie P is what she normally goes by. It's a lot easier. (laughs) But she says, just like Joanna Brown said, I put off finishing pieces and keep starting new projects. May was to be the month for finishing everything, which got extended into June, and I still have unfinished work. I finished three in all of the blank teen. The problem is um, that it seems a chore now instead of a pleasure. I'm a complete opposite of that, you see. I cannot start something new until I've finished the last thing. I wish I could be more like that, where I have lots of things on the go. Yeah, but that's because you're painting big paintings, though, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Well, not always big, but, you know. If it was like little sketch pieces yeah so you would yeah. yeah like say for example what haven't you finished yet what haven't i have i have finished everything <laughs> well, no you not... haven't what haven't i finished children's illustrations oh my gosh yes <laughs> that is that's a time issue that is <laughs> yeah you're right yeah. you're right i've got Catherine c slater and she says starting an online embroidery project was estimated to take two years to complete that was seven or eight years ago. Now I'm module five or six. <laughs> Esther Arroyo, I used to paint portraits with pastel from photos, mostly of children on their first communion, As my and my daughter is the only one in the family who doesn't have one. I should have done it when she was eight. She's turned 25 recently and still no portrait. <laughs> that might be procrastination. Yeah, I think you're right. <laughs> I've got Zoe Hitchhikes and she says, cleaning the dust off the top of my wardrobe. But I did ask her if she had a lot of dust on the top of her wardrobe. And she said, <laughs> not if I procrastinate a lot. <laughs> That's a very good point. Yeah. So I've got Evelyn Aldroyd and she says, I go to the studio intending to begin. I see something that really needs to be cleaned up first. I do that, which leads to another tidying job. And by the time I'm finished cleaning and organising, I have the vacuum cleaner out just because, you know, I I should really finish the cleaning first. Um, It gets to lunchtime and I'm exhausted. This can go on for days, coming across various tasks that need doing. And I don't pick up the brush. I I know exactly where you're coming from there because I can get, I can be guilty of that. Uh, I definitely can't be guilty of that. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I, I procrastinate in other ways, but it's generally not cleaning. Although my office could really do with a good clean at the moment. Um, I've got Beckett Art and Design, and he says, lino printing. I took a course almost three years ago. I even carved a small lino block two years ago. I just haven't printed anything yet. I think I'm afraid of the mess it will make. I have got Radiant Lotus Fine Art. Last year, I read 200 books. I painted one full-size painting. I would like to average one per month. I have done one painting per day challenges in the past. So that's where all the time came from. Yeah, it's reading those 200 books. Well, I think that's pretty amazing in itself. Yeah. (laughs) I've got Chris Lally Art, and they say, I signed up with two separate groups, 52-week online painting courses in January 2020. Of the 104 sessions, I've only watched six. Oops. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah. Diana Valvasori. Getting rid of old unsuccessful paintings instead of painting over them. That's See, I can't, I'm, uh, yeah, I can't paint over paintings I don't like. Because I just yeah, but can't bear to look you, at them. Haven't yours got to be smooth as well? Wouldn't it make a Yeah, difference? it would. Yeah. But yeah, I still, <laughs> I, I still think I'd have a problem with having to look at them again. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I've got Melania and she says, I need a certain thing, brush, paint, paper, etc., to make the project I want. But I'm too lazy to go and buy it. So I improvise what I have. In the end, I'm upset and unhappy because of the result. 
You see, I, now that's something I cannot relate to, and I'll tell you why. Because there is, it's like a sweet shop and art shop to me. <laughs> I, I, there's no way that you could, um, you know, I'd be lazy about buying art materials. <laughs> no, <laughs> I, that's the one thing I love doing. I, but, I'm very, I, I can't be bothered to go shopping for clothes because that bores it bores the hell out of me. But shopping for art supplies, whole different thing. In one way, though, I actually think she's not procrastinating in some ways. Maybe she's procrastinating on getting the thing, but to improvise is almost not to procrastinate because she's like, oh, I'm going to make it anyway. Yeah, that's very true. Um, I have got art comes out. Um, At age 50, I made the decision to never work in an office again. Next job was on a farm and I thrived until I crashed hard due to the same old issues with management and co-workers. But that led to me pursuing a mental health DX against even medical advice. And now I'm doing what I've always wanted to do. Art! Hashtag ADHD and initiative. Is that right? Inattentive. Inattentive. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) And we have a brand new question for you, which is... Um, it's an unusual one. It's continue the phrase, I would never paint dot, dot, dot. So continue the phrase, I would never paint dot, dot, dot. What about you, Tara? What would you I knew you were going to ask. I was waiting for you to ask me. Uh, and you know what the answer is, don't you? Um, well, the landscapes, probably. I would never paint a still life in oils. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yours could could probably. I would never paint an astro fa- face in near colours. <laughs> <laughs> what would yours be? Um, I would never paint um, art that deliberately shocks or is created to make the viewer feel uncomfortable. Do you remember that um, somebody out there did? I can't remember the name, but they 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 did a painting of their dead mother i think it was oh god oh it was either or it might have been mother on the deathbed i I think it was actually when she died and she painted now i don't i i couldn't do something like that um i think some art out there is actually made to shock us and i think it's to get noticed i suppose and i think there's certain things i definitely wouldn't do to get noticed and i'll tell you what another thing um I wouldn't paint is erotic art. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't paint that. There was this person. Oh God, um, I saw it on some art documentary, and I don't know. See, I don't know that you can call this art. But basically, they were making clay. They were artists, but they were like, um, I don't know, t- uh, touchy feely art, if you know what I mean, like yeah. using clay and things like that. Yeah, there must be a better word for that. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Sculptures, sculptures, sculptures. Touchy feely. Oh, I'll give it another Sculpt- name. Touchy feely yeah. art. Well, they were basically taking um, clay uh, imprints out of um, various nether regions. Oh, right. And Very putting nice. it across the wall. I mean, who wants to? F- who wants to no. go and look at a wall full of hairy Marys? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> I personally, I personally think. That is not an art exhibition. That is an art exhibitionist. And yeah. I think that when people do that, and you could, I could probably get a lot of people telling me I'm wrong here, but I feel that there are a lot of artists out there that do this kind of thing to get them noticed. And that is what I would never do. I would never do something just to get noticed because I, I just find that uncomfortable. Do you remember we actually had someone in our group once who painted... I don't know if you could call it erotic art, but it was lady parts. Um, but, <laughs> but they did them. But they did it in this like flowery abstract way. Um, yeah, because I remember we... getting a text from you going, "Am I seeing things?" <laughs> <laughs> I looked at it and went, and I showed Paul, and he went, "I can't even say what you said." But he said, "Yeah, it's a yeah." What? Why? What? Why? Has Tara sent you a picture of a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, we had to we had to delete that, didn't we? Because even though it was done in a very soft kind of uh, hide, <laughs> hiding it, hide it, yeah, soft poor way, in a very hidey what it is way, it was like yeah, we we'd sort of already made a rule that we don't mind we don't mind nudity. So if if someone paints a you know uh, life drawing, nude, that's fine as long as it's not um, embarrassing. Yeah, or, yeah, not yeah, 
erotic, like you say. Or, erotic, yes. Yeah. So, yeah, yes. that, that was quite funny. I remember that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, As, so back to the question because people have already forgotten oh, what yes, it was. Sorry. Continue the phrase, I would never paint, dot, dot, dot. So as always, you can tweet us your answers at Kit Creatives or let us know in the Facebook group. And if you haven't joined that, I suggest you do. Uh, we'll put the question up there and also on the Facebook page and, of course, on our Instagram, which is Kicking the Creatives. So I hope that gave you the kick in the creatives you needed. And don't forget to pop over to our website at kickinthecreatives.com to find out how you can take part in some of our upcoming creative challenges. And of course, there you can also subscribe to the podcast so you never miss an episode. And if you are enjoying the podcast, we've been really enjoying the reviews. and We'd be so grateful if you would leave us a little review on um, either iTunes or whatever platform you listen to us on. Um, or even just a star rating if you don't have much time, um, as long as it's fine. <laughs> yeah. And uh, also, don't forget to check out our art course, How to Use Water Soluble Wax Pastels, which you can find at kickinthecreatives.com forward, cla- forward slash <laughs> kickinthecreatives.com forward slash neocolors. And if you enjoy what we do and you'd like to help support us here at Kick in the Creatives, you can now do so by buying us a coffee. And you can find the link to our Ko fi page on our website. So that's it for today, and we'll see you next time. Bye. Bye. Thank you so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the episode. And if you did, perhaps you'd like to share it and leave a review for us on iTunes. Back soon. No, I know. Oh, no. Here's my printer. (laughs) I can't hear it. (laughs) Every episode, my bloody printer, I forget to turn it off. (laughs) And it turns itself off. It's had 24 hours to do you, that. You've got a brand new uh, nine-week-old puppy and it's the printer that is being the pain. <laughs>